tonight we're going to clean up some loose ends for ionizing radiation. Next week we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about non-ionizing radiation. Um, we actually have, in, I think, in the syllabus, two weeks on non-ionizing radiation. I think Brian's a nut on non-ionizing radiation. So, just quick review. We uh, 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 we started last couple of weeks. We started with uh, 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 very highly energized particles and uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation, uh, a part of the electromagnetic spectrum where the energy levels are high enough to ionize uh, atoms and molecules. In other words, knock electrons off of them. So we talked about the different kinds of uh, uh, primary kinds of radiation that we're interested in examining. Some of it was particle, alpha, beta. Um, uh, uh, some of it was uh, electromagnetic, gamma rays, X-rays, um, uh, neutrons, particles. Again, uh, uh, each of them had their own properties. Each of them had their uh, 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 different effects on human body, uh, on workers, their relative risks, and so on and so forth. Uh, alpha particles uh, won't penetrate skin, for instance, but they're a serious internal hazard. Gamma rays will, of course, penetrate uh, uh, your body. Uh, 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 and is uh, difficult to shield. So we went through quite a bit of that stuff, just kind of as a review. Um, we talked about different kinds of units that we work with in terms of uh, measuring radiation, uh, starting off with uh, Curies and Becquerels, uh, which counted basically were based on, Becquerels are based on the number of disintegrations per unit time. And uh, Curies similarly, we're based on that as well, loosely. One Curie is really kind of roughly one Becquerel, but it's really kind of based on uh, the disintegration rate of radium because that's what the Curies were working with at the time. Okay, so, but it comes up almost it's, uh, almost the same thing. Um, uh, we and we talked about the idea that <clears throat> that, that, that we have uh, different kinds of radiation they have different kind of health effects. So uh, uh, when we measure radiation, in addition to using a scale like Becquerel's and Curie's, we also uh, uh, measure it in terms of the amount of energy uh, that's being uh, uh, applied per unit area. And the two basic units we use there are grays and rads. Um, uh, uh, while that measures the amount of energy that we're dealing with, uh, the health effects based on what kind of radiation it is are going to differ. In other words, the risk are going to differ. So we apply a weighting factor or a quality factor to that measurement of the radiation, the absorbed dose of radiation. And uh, that new measurement is called REM. And that's basically, uh, or Sieverts if we're using a uh, 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 international scale. So that basically is really what we're concerned about where humans are concerned. Right, because that that takes into account the type of radiation is the amount of energy in it and the health effects for humans. Okay, so dose equivalent uh, REM uh, is equal to the number of rads, the amount of energy uh, times a quality factor. Um, quality factor for X-rays, gamma rays is one. For alpha particles, is 20. So the the same level of energy applied uh, uh, from those particles is a lot more dangerous, particularly if it's internal. Uh, we want you a whole bunch of formulas that, this, that uh, uh, based on uh, 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 half-life radiation, the nature of, of uh, disintegrations, the, the uh, uh, mass and the number of atoms that we're dealing with, uh, the, uh, 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 and so on, and various, various other uh, 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 situations. And we found that there's a lot of things that this kind of energy has in common with some other types of energy that we've um, uh, been working with, particularly, it's, for instance, like noise. We sort of had some similar properties in terms of uh, 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 what happens to it when you uh, um, uh, work at different distances from it and so on and so forth. So we, and, and uh, we also dealt with a lot of formulas that helped us do conversions from the amount of radioactive active activity that we're measuring to the actual dose for a human being. Okay, there's some more formulas. And some more, I handed out, and, and this is a summary of the formulas that are on the sheet that I handed out. And they were all, these are all literally copy and pasted from the 
PowerPoint from the last two weeks. We're going to be working with them uh, shortly. First, uh, I handed out the the, the uh, problems I handed out are uh, generally kind of a survey of those formulas, you know, uh, different applications for those formulas. We're gonna work with those. We're gonna work those out in class today um, and uh, using the formula sheet and these uh, problems. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take basically the same kind of problems. I'm gonna change the numbers on them and I'll post them as a homework. So you'll have a preview basically of what the assignment's gonna be. So if you have any issues with the figuring out what formulas to use and so on and so forth, this, will, this should help you out. We'll record it as best I can. Presumably it'll work out and record well. And if you need to go back and decide which formulas you need to use for any particular function, you'll be able to go back and figure that out. Okay, yeah, you need all of that, that whole thing and this, good. Okay, so um, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what can go wrong sometimes. Okay, so nuclear power plant, first nuclear power plant, uh, commercial nuclear power plant built in the United States was built in 1957, commissioned in Shreveport, Pennsylvania. Uh, it operated until 1982. Since that, since from there until 1973, the number of plants in the United States grew very quickly. Uh, when I went to college, which was in the late 60s, the uh, there were two things they told me that neither one of them came through. One of them was that nuclear power is going to make electricity too cheap to meter. That's number one. That didn't turn out, right? And number two was that Xerox was going to uh, uh, Xerox and, um, and microcomputers were going to make it so that uh, uh, we'd have paperless offices. And all they did was find a new way to generate paper and stuff like that, even more paper, more more uh, more efficiently, right? So the number of plants grew very quickly. We haven't had any new power plants built or commissioned since 1978. What happened around that time that kind of put a damper on uh, on uh, the uh, building of nuclear power plants? The Cold War. What, what, well, yeah, Cold War, I guess, but not so much a Cold War. But what 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 accident did we have? Three Mile Island, right? We had we had a uh, a near meltdown of a reactor about, I guess, uh, uh, that's on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. So it's probably about maybe 120 miles from New York City. So uh, that was a pretty serious accident. Um, uh, anybody remember, anybody know what happened there? Well, for starters, let's talk about nuclear power plants. What are they? It's a, it's a good picture. Is that coming up behind me? Can you see that? Okay. So basically, a nuclear power plant, just a way to produce steam. You make steam to turn a, at high pressure to turn a steam turbine to generate electricity. That's the whole point of this whole thing. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they'd be using coal, oil, uh, nowadays maybe natural gas to uh, uh, produce the energy to boil water, to spin that turbine and produce electricity. Uh, Niagara Falls, they, they use uh, hydropower, they use uh, the uh, connect, the the uh, uh, the potential energy of the water and it's and its kinetic energy pushing down falling from that height and going through its turbines to spin the turbines and produce electricity in this case what you're doing is you're using a nuclear fusion a nuclear fission reaction to produce heat to boil water to spin those turbines now you have to control the the once you spun those turbines for instance uh, in New York City, we do it right here on the East River. Uh, there's a, um, a plant that Con Ed has with those three big smokestacks uh, uh, by Long Island City and East River. And uh, they burn oil and gas to produce steam, to spin turbines. And they may produce steam, you know, I'm, I'm guessing now, but uh, this should be pretty close. They probably produce steam uh, initially at about six or 700 pounds per square inch. That goes into a turbine, it spins the turbine, comes out the other side of the turbine about maybe 350 pounds per square inch, then goes into another turbine, spins that turbine, comes out about uh, uh, 250 PSI, goes into a third turbine, comes out maybe about 125 PSI. At that point, maybe 75 to 125 PSI. At that point, it doesn't really have enough energy to efficiently generate electric. So they have to do something with that steam, okay? In a nuclear power plant, with that excess heat, they send it to a cooling tower. They condense it and send it to a cooling tower. 
that's what they do with that heat. So, so that's why you see that those are ginormous cooling towers next to uh, plants, or they're located on a river where they can use the river to uh, dissipate heat. But they need to get rid of that heat because they need they 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 have that steam. They have to reuse that water back in the reactor in order to uh, keep it cool, right? And main, and and control the uh, reaction in New York City. What what do we do with steam in New York City from our plants from that Con Ed plant? River. Right. Where's it go? Goes to half the buildings in New York City. Goes to pro almost all of the buildings south of Central Park. And many in some north of Central Park, almost all the buildings south of Central Park get steam piped underground. This waste steam piped underground to their buildings, where there's a, per, a pressure reducing system, where they take the 75 or 125 psi steam, reduce it to 10 or 15 pounds, and it's supplied to the building to heat their building to produce hot water and so on and so forth. Most buildings south of 57th Street don't have boilers anymore. Don't have smokestacks on the buildings. Don't have uh, are not burning fuel to produce heat anymore in the winter time. So that's the way that we deal with that waste heat in New York City. With a power plant, you don't always have that option, and you need continuous cool water. Okay, so that, that's what those cooling towers do. So this is just a mechanism for boiling water. Uh, um, we they they use a nuclear fuel that's that's fissionable. Uh, that, that has a reaction that they can control. We know that they use control rods. We've heard of that and so on and so forth. We'll hear more about those control rods in just a little bit. So that's the deal. That's, that's what we do in these plants. Now, what happened in Three Mile Island? Three Mile Island, they were doing running. Uh, it seems like all this stuff is associated with them running tests at some time or another. They're running some sort of test and some safety valve had been bypassed and some control had been uh, uh, neglected and so on and so forth. And what happened was they lost cooling water. The water stopped flowing to, through the system to the cooling tower. The pressure built up in the system. So what happened was that a steam bubble formed in the boiler that, that uh, filled the top of the reactor chamber and threatened to expose the core of the reactor. In other words, the reactor is continuously kept under some kind of water. It might be heavy water, might be plain water, but it's continuously submerged in water. So this threatened to expose the core of the reactor. In fact, it did wind up exposing some of the core of the reactor. Um, uh, so not only did it start to melt down the reactor, in other words, the reactor started to fuse and, and, and the danger was that the, the uh, fissionable material would melt and then literally melt through the floor of the reactor, hit water, underground water, and then like wind up exploding when it, from the heat and the pressure when it hit underground water. That's called a meltdown, right? They were concerned about a meltdown. They didn't get a meltdown, but they were in serious danger of having a, an explosion. The temperatures got so high that there was concern that they were dissociating hydrogen and oxygen inside the chamber where there was water, and it was concerned that if that ignited, that it would blow the top off the reactor and discharge all this. Uh, radioactive material. We saw that happen in Ukraine. We're going to talk about that in just a little while as well. So anybody know uh, who was president at that time? This was 1973. Nope. Carter. Carter, right, exactly. Carter. Why was Carter? Now, Carter actually went to the site of this accident. Why was Carter unique, who was president at the time, and over the objections of the Secret Service because of the hazard, why was he uniquely suited as president to go to visit this site? Anybody have any idea what his history was? He was a naval officer. Anybody know what kind of ship he commanded? Nuclear submarine. Nuclear submarine, exactly, right? He was a nuclear submarine commander, right? And he was a nuclear engineer as well. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, good guess, right? And he was a nuclear, excellent guess. So, and he was a nuclear engineer. So, I mean, that, since then, uh, it's been very difficult to commission um, uh, uh, power plants in the United States. The, the, we had one that very came, came very close to being commissioned on Long, North Shore of Long Island, Shoreham. Um, and that one uh, was literally being constructed into the late 80s, I think, or something like that. And eventually they converted it to a coal plant or an oil plant, and it's running now for uh, to produce electricity using fossil fuels. Anybody know why they couldn't get managed to get that one commissioned? Well, politically, it seemed like a, seemed like a bad bet politically after that Three Mile Island accident. And there was a lot of concern that if they had a, 
an occurrence like Three Mile Island, if something like that happened, they couldn't have a suitable evacuation plan for the uh, for the uh, towns and uh, and villages around the plant, right? In other words, you know, in North Shore, Long Island, the only escape route is Long Island Expressway, right? Yeah, that's still working. Good. Okay, so that didn't work out. So, so we've had our own experiences with that. Okay, let's go back. Okay, so we got our formulas there. Okay, there's three. There's a picture of Three Mile Island. They made a movie about it. The movie, actually, I, you know, let me back that up a second. The movie called The China Syndrome. By the way, this idea of melting down and hitting the water, the groundwater, and then exploding. Uh, 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 that would that that's that was called a China syndrome back in those days in terms of a meltdown because the idea was that this stuff would be so dense and so hot that it would melt through the ground and go to China, you know, get completely through the earth. Of course, it won't do that, <laughs> but that's what they called it. They called it a China syndrome that it would like literally melt through the bottom of the reactor. Uh, but there was a potential for it melting through the bottom of the reactor, hitting groundwater, and then exploding. So that's true. So the movie was called the China syndrome. The movie came out two weeks before the accident. How about that, right? How about that for a coincidence? Oh, wow. Right. So at any rate, if you ever get a chance to see it, uh, Jane Fonda and uh, I'm trying, who is that? Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, and um, Grumpy Old Men. I can't think of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jane now is. I think Jane now is right. She's up on the Capitol getting arrested again this week. Right. What's that? Yeah, I mean, she's getting arrested. Yeah, every Friday. She does it every Friday, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, okay. So, anyway, that's what happened there. Partial core meltdown. Uh, there's 110 nuclear power plants in the United States. They produce 20% of the total power it produced in the United States. So, they have a significant contribute to the amount of electrical power that we generate in this country. France produces 75%, I thought it was 50%, turns out 75% of its power using nuclear energy. Now, keep in mind though, France, we're talking about a much smaller country. France is the size of, I guess, maybe, is it, is it bigger than Texas or smaller than Texas? Yeah, some, somewhere around the size of Texas, right? So, it, and they're, they're a much less industrialized society than we are uh, uh, a smaller country. So it's a little bit easier for them to do this, but they've also accomplished that because they, they, the government, it's a government, it's government run, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear industry, and they've settled on a relatively uniform conservative design for their plants. So they get a lot less objectionable. Building them in France is uh, one's, runs into a lot less opposition than it does here. Most of the nuclear plants in the United States are on the East Coast, Northeast Coast, Northeast for the most part. Few in California, not many in the middle of the country. Obviously, one of the things is you can produce an enormous amount of power, but you need people around the plant to transmit it to. So transmission is an issue, right? So you're not going to see too many of them in Colorado because they don't need them in Colorado, right? Or the, the, the transmission issue would um, uh, would um, uh, uh, the transmission issue would outweigh the advantage of being able to generate a lot of power in one spot. Uh, in order to get these things to run, you got to mine uranium. And the uranium that they mine is predominantly uranium-238. That's not feasible in these reactors. They need uranium-235. Of the uranium-238, the uh, uranium-235 constitutes less than 1% of the semi-refined ore. They dig it out of the ground, they wash it, they dissolve it with water and wash it, and so on and so forth, and then, and then strain it out and so on. And uh, the, the product that they get is called yellow cake. Looks like that. Okay, you probably heard that, but there's an issue with yellow cake uh, a while ago where there was some issue whether or not uh, Iraq was collecting, was stockpiling yellow cake to start a reactor and so on and so forth. Well, they can't, they can't do anything with this because only about, got a, less than a percent of uranium-235 of uranium and it needs to be refined. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's then, refined to three to five percent and that's visible in reactors it's not high enough uh, 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 a percentage of uranium-235 to sustain presumably to sustain a an uncontrolled nuclear reaction in other words a bomb so that would that typically is about anywhere from 70 to 90 percent i think 
Okay. So at any rate, problem is, is that in order to get a small amount of uranium-235, you got to take a lot of rock and a lot of uranium out of the ground. So for one ounce of ore, you have 99 ounces of tailings, tailings being the waste or the remainder of the uh, 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 less uh, of the uh, 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 insufficiently uh, uh, enriched uh, 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 leftovers of this thing. So in every year in the United States, um, uh, and oh, actually over the period of time, we've collected about 140 million tons of tailings. It's, it, it, it's not, uh, it's rare, but it occasionally winds up in the wrong spot. We're, I think we've got, we got a slide where we talk about that in a second. Um, uh, along with this mining, there are workers exposed to uh, uh, radon gas from the mines. Uh, nowadays, I don't think they, they, they uh, build ground mines. I think they have other techniques for uh, 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 using uh, uh, drilling, uh, drilling wells and so on and so forth to kind of like flush it or wash it out of, uh, out of, uh, uh, out of the ground. But uh, where there are wells, where there's open pit mining, uh, they do have it. There's increased risk of uh, cancer for workers. They're exposed to radon gas, uh, particulates that uh, from this from the uh, mining operation, and so on and so forth. Okay, mining waste: uh, 1,100 tons of tailings, 90 million gallons of contaminated water were released into a stream on a Navajo reservation. A lot of these deposits of uranium are at, that that are uh, uh, concentrated enough to be mineable are located out in the west. And a lot of them are in areas that are uh, uh, are adjoining or even on Indian reservations. Uh, they've had a few incidents incidents with that. They have, I think, they have something like there's 500 mines now on uh, Navajo and other Indian reservations that the EPA now is trying to uh, secure and clean up. Okay, let's see. Mine tailings are oh, that, as I said. These tailings wind up, you know, they're waste. So they wind up being used as uh, 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 materials to combine with, say, cement and concrete, and to make concrete and so on and so forth. And they were incorporated into concrete in, in uh, uh, for some building in Colorado. Okay, $700 million to remediate the uh, materials that they wound up uh, using. Um, again, abandoned uranium mines continue to uh, uh, cause problems on these reservations. Okay, so the, fuel, the, the fuels themselves are the uranium-235 that's been refined to 5%, let's say, is, is fused into little pellets, into pellets. Those pellets are packed into, uh, 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 are in, into these rod assemblies, and they are uh, uh, separate, they, they are installed in the reactor uh, so that they are close enough for uh, 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 the fissionable material to be able to affect each other, but they have uh, between them devices or medium to control the, uh, 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 the amount of neutrons, the energy of the neutrons, and the, uh, 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 and the, uh, uh, and, and, how often or how often disintegrations happen in these systems. So, so uh, you, have fuel rod, you have fuel rod assemblies and you also have control rod assemblies as well. The control rods are materials that absorb or moderate the uh, uh, production of neutrons. So nuclear fission, what are we doing where we are splitting, well, we're starting a reaction where uh, uranium-235 um, uh, is split by a neutron from an incident neutron from some other uh, reaction, uh, just a natural decay uh, by a nearby molecule uh, atom. Um, uh, when it hits a near, when it when it strikes uh, a at the, if it has the right energy, when it strikes another uranium two thirty five uh, uh, atom, uh, it splits that atom into two parts, and uh, part the total weight of the new materials is less than the original weight of the uh, uranium-235 atom. That difference in weight is converted into energy and additional neutrons. Those additional neutrons then can go on and strike other atoms and, and, and maintain a continuous uh, 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 process of producing energy and, and providing new neutrons to split other atoms. 
Okay, control rods are there to kind of control this whole process, to moderate the number of neutrons, the amount of neutrons that are being produced and the number of disintegrations that are going on that are causing these, uh, that's pr producing energy. The real key here is that this is a, a lot more complicated than I'm describing it. Uh, there's many issues that are involved here that control this reaction. There is, the, the actual, the, the devices themselves are uh, 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 constructed um, and uh, suspended in materials that moderate the reaction. So in other words, it, you know, it's kind of like, even though it's self-sustaining, it's also, if the design is correct, it should also be self-limiting as well. The control rods can be used to decide how much energy you want to produce, more or less energy, depending on what your demand is, right? But essentially, the design should be such that uh, uh, the control rods are, are, are kind of a, a uh, controlling factor for energy production rather than a, a, an emergency device, although they are also, uh, also act as emergency devices. Okay, this is a, usually these are contained, so if there is an accident, a, a, a disruption in the operation of the equipment, a pipe rupture or something like that, that the radiation presumably is going to be contained inside the reactor vessel. Okay, so presumably it's impossible because of the amount of material, the type of the material, the percentage of uranium 235, presumably it's impossible for this material to explode. In other words, have a, an out of control nuclear reaction that actually acts like a bomb. Okay, but we'll, we'll uh, and, and there are some people who think that it came pretty close to that at Chernobyl. We'll, we'll talk about this. But in general, anybody, how many of you guys saw the movie Chernobyl on TV? Nobody saw the movie on TV? You guys like science at all? I mean, no one watched that. It's on, what, uh, what network is it on? What is it? HBO, it's on HBO, you really should take a look at it. It's really pretty interesting. There's a lot, it's very dramatic, but the first part, if you're gonna watch any of it, watch the first episode. Because the first episode, you see, a, you, you'll you recognize a lot of the issues that we're dealing with here. How you measure radiation, um, uh, how, it's, how uh, energy is generated, how the controls operate and so on and so forth. You really should at least watch the first episode. After that, it's more about cleanup and the, and the uh, uh, result, and there's a lot of human interest stories and so on and so forth, uh, and even does get a little gory as well. So, uh, you know, what, you, you, maybe you're not interested in that, but at least watch the first episode, because it'll really kind of, uh, uh, I think it'll kind of like reinforce some of the stuff that we're talking about here. Okay, so, yes. In order to separate uranium-235, from 238, you, the, the difference is a very small difference in mass. And if you want to separate, you want to further refine it, you need to get that uranium-235 all by itself. What they do is they turn it into a gas, and the gas centrifuge separates by using the density 238 from 235. So that's basically, I don't know exactly what the process is, but first they have to, they have to heat it till it's a gas, and then spin it until they can they can they can in stages like one stage may go from five percent to seven percent seven to eight not eight to fifteen and it, it's a it's an arduous process so that's really what the centrifuges do is they separate uh materials of different mass right and sp more specifically the 235 from the from the 238 and plutonium from the other materials that it might be combined with to concentrate them okay and that's why that's why the, the, the their uh, low speeds, they're not concerned about I, Iran having, low, uh, it's starting up its low speed centrifuges right now because they are apparently only capable of refining to 5% or so, 3 to 5% for fissionable reactors and so on. But then uh, one of the products in, in the nuclear reactor is, is plutonium. So now you have plutonium that's part of the waste of this reactor and that then can be used as a uh, a fuel for other reactors or for nuclear weapons as well. So, and apparently it takes less of the plutonium to, to uh, get a critical mass than the uranium-235, but there's reasons why they're concerned about that as well. But, but the real key is, is that, yeah, depending on the efficiency of the centrifuge, how it operates, 
uh, uh, you have limits on how much you can concentrate this stuff. And they're more concerned about the next stage where they go to these higher pressure, higher uh, velocity centrifuges. Okay, so uh, they're gonna, okay, I'm gonna, okay, the core meltdown is what you're really concerned about. You don't want this stuff to melt together so you completely lose control of it and it escapes its containment. Okay, uh, Chernobyl, by the way, is in Ukraine, the northern part of Ukraine. Um, uh, in this, it says a, it was a very poor design, was unstable, lack containment. It, you know, it, it's true it's lack containment. It, didn't it did not have a containment dome on it. Um, uh, so for that reason alone, you wouldn't see this type of reactor in the United States. The other thing is, is that it used as a moderator instead of water. And we're going to talk, I have a great video that will go into this in detail. Instead of in, the, the neutrons that come off of the splitting of these atoms, neutrons come off very high energy. Um, they're not very efficient at maintaining when they're at that high energy, not very efficient at maintaining the a chain reaction that's going on in the uh, system. So you want something that, 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 that this system is contained in, that this core is retained, contained in, that will slow down those neutrons, remove some energy from those neutrons so it works more efficiently. Um, um, in, in most reactors in the United States, they use water or heavy water or trinium as that moderator because it slows down the neutrons. Um, in this system, it used graphite for that purpose. So these, these, uh, uh, these control rods and these fuel rods are surrounded or embedded in graphite in order to uh, moderate the speed of those neutrons and keep that uh, the fission going. Um, um, uh, so you could argue that, yeah, you know, maybe, uh, obviously it's tough for me to say that it wasn't a, uh, a stable design, you know, that was unstable, it wasn't a good design, but it worked pretty well for a long time and they still have this type of reactor working there. And uh, 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 they haven't had any other accidents like this. Okay, then there were a lot of issues here in terms of human error that uh, uh, that occurred. Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, it was just sealed up. Matter of fact, I want to let me play a couple of these now. Okay. So what happened in Chernobyl? Uh, most reactors, water is used as a coolant, um, uh, as it is in this one. The moderator is a graphite, but they still use water as a coolant coolant, that water is also used to produce, it produces as steam, and the steam is used to run that uh, turbine. Um, the steam, uh, as you produce steam in these, in these uh, systems, uh, some of it, it uh, the water becomes less dense. So the action of the water in moderating the reaction, as the steam, as the steam pressure goes up, uh, becomes less. When it's cooler and it's not boiling, it's much more e efficient at moderating the reaction. Uh, uh, Chernobyl used graphite to primarily moderate the reaction, but it also has water. It also uses water because it's making steam in this reactor. Okay. Um, there were, uh, I'm going to play the video because that's really going to fill you in on this whole thing. That's the reactor after the explosion. And those those pieces down here, those are pieces of the core. Those are the graphite. That's part of the graphite structure that was holding the fuel pellets, the fuel rods. Two plant workers were killed immediately. Over the next several days, uh, 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 dozens of emergency workers and uh, uh, and uh, uh, plant personnel that's acute, that succumbed to radiation sickness. Um, and uh, most of the radiation that was released from the uh, reactor was iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137. Of course, with iodine-131, we know that they're going to use, they're going to be giving iodine supplements to people, and so on and so forth. Okay, eventually they closed up an 18-mile area around the plant. They evacuated 350,000 people, I believe. And um, it hasn't been reoccupied since. And it doesn't look like it'll be uh, reoccupied for something like 2,400 years. Okay, 28 of the workers died within four months. Uh, uh, most of the fallout uh, traveled towards Belarus. Um, they initially tried to deny that there was an accident going on, but they, the nuclear power plants that monitor trace levels of 
radio radioactivity because they're concerned about their own processes having releases, notice that there was uh, issues that they were picking up, that they were actually detecting radiation that wasn't uh, coming from them, uh, so that they knew that there must have been some sort of incident somewhere in the world. It wound up uh, contaminating large areas of Norway, Scandinavia, Europe, and, uh, Europe, and so on. Okay, let me just play that video. Uh, we'll talk about Indian Point later. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. You guys want to take a quick break? Yeah. It's okay, good. Good time for it. This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so one, one of the issues with these kind of releases, when there's accidents, emergencies, when there's waste that's not handled properly, is that there's uh, once it gets into the environments, it can wind up in a lot of different places. Uh, this out, the fallout from Chernobyl, from nuclear tests, and so on and so forth, can wind up wind up in uh, 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 in the soils, winds up in plants. Uh, plants are eaten by uh, 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 animals. The animals wind up in the food chain and so on. Uh, you can have surface deposits, wind up in bodies of water and fish. There's uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Fukusha, Fu Fukushima reaction uh, reactor disaster. There's uh, uh, now uh, radioactive materials washing up in California, fit, we're turning up in some, some, uh, 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 some seafood and so on. Uh, so it really gets, into, once it gets into the food chain, I can get around quite a bit. Um, one of the issues with the Chernobyl reaction was the release of iodine 131. Uh, winds up in, in uh, uh, pasture lands that for many countries in, in Europe, in, uh, uh, in uh, Scandinavia, in Russia. Uh, uh, and from there, the, um, uh, it winds up in the milk, winds up in children's thyroid glands. Uh, and they're, uh, they're growing, they're especially sensitive to radioactive iodine. Uh, so uh, many of the children were treated uh, after this release. Many of the children were treated for a while with uh, uh, iodine supplements. Okay, and it persists in the environment. In fact, here's an article on 
um, uh, 30 years later, they're still finding reindeer in, no in Norway that are contaminated from the uh, Chernobyl uh, releases. And that's an issue because they have an indigenous population that relies on them for food. Okay, so um, uh, we have a closest reactor that we have to us is Indian Point, which is scheduled to be shut. They've been talking about shutting it down for the last 20 years. It's finally gonna be shut down uh, in April of 2020. Okay, um, one of the other issues is that once you are done with radioactive sources, whether it's an XRF or uh, uh, medical devices and so on, um, uh, they're no longer in use. They need to be properly handled and disposed of. There was an incident in Brazil, um, uh, in central Brazil, where um, these are basically kids broke into an abandoned cancer clinic and stole some of the instruments that were intending to uh, recycle the materials there for scrap. Um, they found a, um, a, a therapy machine that used it, yeah, that had cesium. Um, they disassembled it and inadvertently released the radiation that was in it. Uh, they got sick. They the doctors thought it was food poisoning. Didn't suspect that kind of release. But now once that stuff uh, had had left the um, uh, secure area of the clinic, the the old clinic, um, it wound up uh, it wound up getting moved around. Uh, one group of kids thought it was, uh, it contained gunpowder, the material of powder room was gunpowder. They tried to remove it. They eventually just got rid, since they, since they didn't light, they couldn't light it up and they realized it wasn't gunpowder after it had been contaminated, they sold it to a scrap metal dealer. Scrap metal dealer noticed that it would glow in the dark. So he brought it home and played with it with his family. So a significant number of people in that community, whole community became ill. Uh, uh, before the doctors eventually started to suspect, to suspect radiation poisoning. 240 people were injured, four of them died from that incident. And that's from uh, uh, a, a, um, uh, a medical device that was improperly handled. Uh, then I have on, on, black, uh, on Blackboard, I have a series of other accidents that involved uh, releases and, and spills and, and waste issues and so on and so forth in the various decades. Of course, the most recent one is the uh, uh, Fukushima uh, uh, reactor, which was which was um, uh, 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 which following I think I think a uh, uh, an enormous earthquake and a tsunami, uh, the operating the uh, uh, pumps and the cooling system was flooded and submerged and went offline. So one of the reactors wind up melting down. They're still involved in the cleanup and dealing with the releases from that. Okay, let's move on to the exercises. Okay, and what I have here, and I will put this up later, so you can have it as well, but I've actually added in the relevant formula to each of the uh, questions that we have here. So let's take a look at the first one. A one uh, at one foot from a radiation source, you measure a value of 750 millirem per hour you move a distance, uh, you move back a distance and record a value of 25 millirem per hour. Approximately how far did you move backwards? Okay, well, that's the inverse square law, very much like, uh, like uh, uh, what we deal with with noise. So we have a formula for the inverse square law. Uh, I, I2, which is the radiation at level distance two, at distance two, which is in this case, it's gonna be, uh, let's see, maybe we can do them together here. Okay, so I2 is going to be 25 millirem is equal to I1, which is 750 millirem, okay, times the ratio of the distances squared. D1 is the initial initial energy level, seven, uh, initial distance, which is, uh, what was the initial distance? One foot. one foot. Okay, one foot over D2. Which is, where, which is what we're going to solve for. So 25 over 750 is equal to, uh, point zero, three, three, point, is it point zero, uh, let's see, 25 uh, point zero 0.03, yeah, I think you're right there, is equal to uh, one over uh, D2, yeah. yep, the squared. Okay, so we, uh, so we find square root of both sides. What's the square root of 0 0.33, 0 0.033? 0 
Okay, 0.1, I'll stick with 0.18 for now. Uh, equals one over, uh, well, we equals, let's see, square root of this is one over D2. And cross multiply D2 is equal to one over 1 1.18, winds up being, what is it? 5.48. Are we all in agreement on that? It's just the inverse of 1.18. Everybody's okay with that, right? Nothing complicated there. It'll get worse. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these same problems. I'm going to change the numbers on them later on. That'll be a homework assignment eventually. But I want to go through these in class right now. Person works for 15 hours near a, a, a constant source of whole body gamma radiation, um, 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 uh, resulting in exposure of 0.2 millirem uh, per second. For how many weeks can she be exposed? I guess it's a she. Uh, can she be exposed without exceeding half of the annual OSHA limit for whole body radiation. You may assume that this person, uh, that this uh, that this is the person's first year of work at the job. In other words, she hadn't had any other exposure and that she's not exposed to workplace related radiation during the remainder of the work week. So what is the OSHA limit for, uh, annual limit for uh, exposure? Anybody remember? It's right there, right? What is it? Whole body is one and a quarter per a quarter. So it's 2.5, uh, excuse me, it's five millirem, five, five rem per year. So half a year is 2.5 rem, right? That's what we wanna know. How long can she work before she's exposed to 2.5? Is that what we asked for here? Why do I, why do I remember half? For how many weeks can she exposed uh, without exceeding half of the annual? Okay, without exceeding 2.5 rem. Okay, say something if I'm if I'm getting this wrong, please. Rather, rather than having to correct it when it's online. So how are we gonna calculate this? So she's exposed at what rate? She's exposed at 0 0.002 millirem per second. So for every for every hour, for every minute, times 60 seconds per minute, right? Times uh, 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 60 minutes per hour, right? So her exposure is, how much is it per hour? I got a 108 here. Everybody agree with that? 108 millirem per hour? That's wrong. That seems like a lot, right? Oh, per week? Okay, you went, you, okay, you, I mean, what you, how many hours in a week? Oh, oh, that's right. We said 15 hours per week. Okay, times 15, and that's 108 millirem. I'm taking your word for this, right? Yes. Okay, good. That's per week, right? And we want to know how many weeks can she work for, right? So we have 2.5 divided by one, uh, 2,500, change it to millirem, divided by 108. And what do we wind up with? How many weeks? We got an answer. It's like 24 weeks. 23.2500 millirem is our maximum exposure. She's getting 108 per week. 20 23.1 weeks. Okay, and that's what we we asked is that the units that we asked for in weeks. Okay. So I know Yeah, how many weeks? Okay, the units that we were looking for which weeks. So we're done with that one. Yes. Uh, because it was, um, uh, we asked, uh, we wanted to know how long she could be exposed, half, half, half of the OSHA, annual OSHA limit, which is five. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, I'm going to start here, and then we'll talk about which formulas we're, we're going to apply. Calculate the radiological half white half-life of phosphorus 32 if its initial activity was 700 picocuries, which is reduced to 164 picocuries after 30 days. Next, calculate the phosphorus's effective half-life 
if the biological half-life is 1155 days. We did something, we went over something like this uh, when we were working on the PowerPoints, I think. Okay, so we wanna calculate how much radiation will remain after a given time. Okay, so let's see, we got a formula that we can use, let's see, three, uh, okay. So I am going to use this formula. Whoops. Oh, I've scrolled that out of the way here, so I can't see it anymore. So the final activity was 164 picocuries uh, is equal to the initial activity, which was 700 picocuries. Let me get more paper. Okay, uh, da -da, okay, Pico Curies times 0.5 to the T, okay, th uh, the, the T is elapsed time in, what are we working with, days? 30 days over the half-life, which is what we want. Okay, so now we have to solve for the half-life. So we're gonna take 160, we're gonna divide by 700 Okay, somebody want to tell me what 164 divided by 700 is? Point, what was that? Point two three four, right, is equal to, and that's, that's unitless because Pico Curies are gone, and is equal to 0. 0.5 to the 30, and that's days over uh, our value that we want for half-life. So now how are we going to solve that? Logarithms, okay, log of 2.234 is equal to uh, 30 days over X times the log of 0. 0.5. Okay, anybody want to have, anybody with a calculator that calculates logs? Log 0.234 is equal to 30 times 0. 0.63. Okay, that's more like a slide rule answer than a you know, a calculator answer, but that's okay, I'll take it, is equal to 30 days over X times, what's the log of 0.5? Negative point three. Negative point three, it sounds right, negative point three. I could use another digit or two. Yeah, negative point three, zero. Point three, zero? zero one, so it's still point three. Okay, all right, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll settle for two decimal places for now. Okay, so both negative, I'm going to bring this over to the other side, divide by negative 0 0.30, and this becomes positive. So what is that? 0.63 divided by 0 0.301? 2.1. Everybody comfortable with that so far? Is equal to 30 days over X. Cross multiply, 30 days equals 2.1 X divided by 2.1. And what do we wind up with? X is equal to 14.3 days. And the, the units wind up being days, right? It's the only thing that's left. The Pico Curies is canceled out. So our units wind up being 14.3 uh, days. What is 14.3 days? What do we just solve for? Right, the half-life, the, the physical half-life of this material. What else did they ask for? The effective half-life. So the effective half-life is a combination of the half-life of the material plus the rate at which your body eliminates it from, uh, it's eliminated from your body. And the biological half-life is 1155 days. So we have another formula that we work with. Okay, it's down there. I will get, I'll scroll up here and try and get it. So I'm gonna remember that 14.3 days. Well, I clear this out. So it's 14.3 days is the physical half-life of the material. And so our effective half-life 
I can't read that. It's too small for me to read it there. The effect of half-life. You know, I, I made it, I'm sorry I made it so small on these things because I was trying to get everything. I was trying to save paper. I guess that was a bad idea. So T effective is equal to the half-life, the, uh, the uh, radi radiological half-life, which is 14.3 days, times the biological half-life, which is how many days was that? How much was that? Got 1155. 1155. Okay, you got to speak up a little bit. Okay, over um, 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 the radiological half life, 14.3, plus the biological half life, 1155. Okay, so let's calculate what's the top. 14.3 times 11.55. Okay, and then what's the units? That's days squared, right? Days squared over, we're going to add these together. It's going to be um, 1169.3 days. That's days on the bottom, right? So we're going to wind up with days as our units. And what, what do we wind up getting here? 11, uh, 15. 1516 divided by 1169 14.12 but it's not much less not much less than the just the physical half life of the material why is that because the biological half life is so is so long right and then compared compared to the half life of the material the biological half life is is an order of magnitude longer. So it doesn't have much impact on how quickly it's uh, uh, eliminated from your body. Okay, so that's good. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Ah. That's that one. Okay, 10 centimeters of shielding material reduces a gamma radiation source from 75 rad. Right, so, so the real answer is the second one, the 14.1. Yes. That's not the real answer, that's what we're looking for. No, with the 14.1, the right, is the effective half-life. In other words, it combines the radiological half-life and the biological half-life. Okay, so this is it's like it's, two answers. That's yeah, the yeah, the first part was just the radiological half-life, which we had to figure out. Once we got that, now we, we had to see, well, your body's at the same time that it's decaying, your body is eliminating it. It's just not eliminating it very fast. So the difference was small. Only went from 14.3 days to 14.1 days because the biological effect of eliminating wasn't very fast. Okay, so 10 centimeters of shielding material reduces a gamma radiation source from 75 rad to 15 millirads. Calculate the tenth the, the tenth value thickness in inches. Okay, this is the thickness needed to reduce the uh, radiation by. This is what we. This is thickness to re reduce it by half, um, uh, and this is the emission rates. The tenth. Why did I? Why did I put tenth? Did I make a mistake here? Okay, hang on. Half-life value in centimeters. Half-life value in centimeters. Thickness of the shielding material. Okay, let's figure out the half-life value first. Uh, calculate 10 to centimeters. 10, Ten centimeters of shielding material. 75 to 15, calculate the 10. Okay. So T is a 10th value. Right, 10th value of thickness, right? One tenth of the original value. 
Um, okay, so let's see what we have here. Um, I2 is the initial um, uh, emission rate, right, which is 0.15, is, uh, excuse me, the final, which is 0.15, is 50, it's 15 millirads, which is the same thing as 0 0.15 rad per hour. I want to get things into the same units uh, as quickly as we can, is equal to the initial uh, 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 energy source, which is 75 rads per hour. Okay, you get what I did there? I, instead of using uh, 15 millirads, I just converted it right away to 15 uh, milli, uh, 15 0.015 rads, divided by two to the thickness of the shielding material, which is 10 centimeters over the half life the uh, uh, um, uh, the half value half value layer which in centimeters so it's hvl and that's what we're looking for that hvl for starters okay so let's figure this out so let's see divide by 75 uh, rads per hour we just did this before that eliminates that uh, equal to one over two to the tenth. Uh, actually, I think maybe it's I got it. I'll do it an easier way. Let me let me do this a little bit more direct way. Okay, hang on a second. So it, what we're doing is we're finding the half value layer. The thickness that the thickness of the material that you need to reduce the radiation in half. Okay, so the initial, the final energy level that we're at is 0 0.015 rad per hour, right? That's 15 millirads is the same thing as point, 15 millirads is the same thing as 0 0.015 rad per hour, is equal to the initial energy, which is 75 rad per hour divided by two to the, the thickness that we're dealing with, which is X, which is 10 centimeters over the half value layer, the thickness of the half value layer. Okay, so I'm gonna cross multiply 75 rad is equal to 0 0.015 rad uh, uh, times two to the uh, 10 centimeter over half value layer, divide by 0 0.15, 0 0.015. Okay, and what does that come out to be? 75 divided by 0 0.015. 5,000, okay. Yeah, it does look right, right? 15, yeah, five. 75, 5,000, and so 5,000 is equal to two to the 10 centimeter divided by half value layer. Okay, again, we're gonna find the log of this, right? Log of 5,000 is equal to the uh, ten, uh, 10 centimeters over the half value layer times uh, the log of two. Okay, so what's, what is uh, the log of 5,000? Good, 3.69 is equal to 10 divided by the half value layer times the log of two, which is? Uh, 0.3, No, I think that was three. Wasn't that the log of three we found before? Yeah, 0.3, negative 0.3. Log of two, I think is gonna be smaller than this. I think we got it wrong in the last time. I think we put down 0 0.301 for the log of three. Uh, uh, log of uh, one half. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Let me get rid of this then. Okay. So point that we just decided it was 0 0.301. Okay. So. Let's see, divide by 0 0.301. 
And what is 3.69 divided by 3.301? I'll call it 12.3 for argument's sake. Okay, so the have value layer times 12.3 is equal to 10 and divide by 12.3. So the half value layer is equal to 0.8. a little less than one, right? Yeah, 0.8. 0.8 something. Okay. So roughly about, about 0.8. And what's the, what are the units here? They're centimeters. Okay. So that's the half value layer. So 0.8 centimeters. I mean, you know, I don't remember if we have a formula for this. So if we if we start out with initially with calculate the tenth value uh, thickness. If we start out with a half value layer um, uh, of say, I'm going to call it one centimeter for argument's sake, one centimeter. So if uh, we're looking for the tenth value, so if we have one centimeter of this material, we can reduce something from say 10 to five. Another centimeter will reduce it from five to two and a half. Another centimeter will reduce it from two and a half to 1.25, right? So we're at about three centimeters is, a is close to the 10th value. I suspect I have a formula here for this that'll actually calculate it accurately, but it's gonna be between three and four centimeters. Can we agree on that? You guys, you, you see what I'm doing there? Yeah. Okay, I'm estimating it. I don't remember if I gave you a formula for that. You guys remember a formula for that? Where's the sheet? I wonder if you can apply like uh, something like the density from something like the distance formula should probably work there. Maybe not. I'll check that out. There may be another, there may be another, there may be a more precise way of estimating it. But if the half value layer is one centimeter, right? We can go from 10 to five with one centimeter of shielding. We can go from five to two and a half with another centimeter of shielding and from two and a half to one and a quarter with a third centimeter of shielding. So the 10th value layer would be between three centimeters and four centimeters. I would love to get a more precise answer to that, but I'll, I'll hold on that and see if we see if I can't find a more precise way of calculating that. In fact, I should have changed that question to just finding the half value layer and kept things simple. So we said we wanted it in inches, so we have to convert it to inches. No, no, oh, that's did it ask for it in inches? Is it not? Yeah, there you go. You have to convert it to inches as well. Okay. And I'll check the answer to that as well. An incident occurs at a laboratory compromising radiological controls. How are we doing on time? We're running out of time. This one's a little bit more complicated. Let's move on to six. Uh, I'm going to give you a version of this that has these form. I'll upload a version of it that has the formulas with the problem, you know, so that the ones we don't get through that you won't have to struggle that much with. The half value layer for shielding material is two inches. If the t intensity of radiation being striking the shield is t to 100, millirem, 100 rem per hour and the shield is 5,000 millimeters thick, what is the intensity in millirem on the other side of the shield? Same formula, right? We're going to use the same, basically the same formula, except this time we're calculating what the, uh, the, the uh, uh, I2 is on the other end of the shield. So you're just going to substitute uh, I1 is, uh, I, you're going to calculate what I2 is. I, I2 is going to be the final radiation level. It's going to be very low, right? So I1 is the initial two to the uh, uh, 5,000 millimeters is what you're working with there. You're going to convert that into centimeters and then divide it by the half value layer. Uh, I'm actually going to convert that. You're going to convert that into centimeters then you're, and, and use that for X. And then you're going to convert the two inches into centimeters as well. So you have I1, you have X, Eight, a half value layer, all in centimeters, 
and to the second power so you can calculate what I2 is, what the final power is after 5,000 millimeters of the shielding. Okay, uh, just, just so you can check yourselves, the answer to that is, that's number six. And number six. It's 2.3 times 10 to the minus 20, 25th rem per hour, right? Which makes sense, enormous amount of shielding there. Okay, how many pico cures of rating would generate 700 disintegrations per minute? Um, one of the I mean, one of the slides early on, I believe, discussed uh, uh, how uh, the basis that the Curies used for estimating the amount of disintegrations that they were getting. They based it on uh, the decay in radiation uh, in radium. Um, one gram of radium decays at the rate of 2.2 trillion disintegrations per minute. 2.2 times 10 to the second. A pico Curie is a trillionth of a Curie, right? So, um, uh, uh, so a Pico Curie represents 2.2 dis disintegrations per minute. Okay, so if we wanna figure out how many Pico Curies of radium would generate 750 disintegrations per minute, we divide that by, what, do I, do I have to change that into moles? No, I don't, I don't think so. We just divide it. I think we just divide it by 2.2 disintegrations per minute. Yeah. So it comes out to something like 2.2 into 750, I think 300 something, 300, 300 disintegrations per minute. The next one, a commercial smoke detector is manufactured with 180 micrograms of americium. How long will it take before the minimum required level of radioactive disintegrations per second has reached? I guess we're getting ready to get out of here. Okay. I'll tell you what, I'll put the formulas up. I'll record solutions to the ones I didn't get to today. So you can use those. The homework assignment will be, this is just classroom exercise. The homework assignment is gonna be the same questions, but with different numbers. So you get to do them on your own. 